it's going to be recorded in a very high risk conditions, and and the the uh, utterance tool can be recorded in a uh, like a noise-free, acoust acoustically perfect conditions, and so on. So that's uh, one of the primary problems in a forensic forensic speaker verification. Okay, I'm not saying that I'm doing forensic speaker verification here, but that this uh, these methods are directly applicable to that. <coughs> Okay, so so then the problem setup is that uh, so we are working towards the human assisted speaker recognition recognition hazard trial uh, case of the current NIST speaker evalu recognition evaluation, and uh, <coughs> we are given uh, 15 difficult trials, and and we have to we have to give a decision for each of these trials whether they are the same person or not who is speaking in those, and. Uh, Okay, so going back to that, the uh, the forensic case, well, there might be some non-cooperative speakers, some, some speech disguise, for example. We, here we assume that everybody is cooperating. And uh, this is uh, one of the main... Okay, so there's, uh, there's a case when you, you can you can assume that you, can, you are doing a speech, speech disguise, and I will call that later. But in, uh, in this case, everybody is cooperative. They can be recorded in uh, over telephone or in an interview situation. Okay, so then misclassification costs are equal, and the uh, the target and no target probability ratios are also equal. So the classification error is a good proxy for equal error rate right, in this case. <coughs> Otherwise, it's not. I mean, like if you have a very high imbalance, like in a normal speaker verification case, the, that is at least a factor. I mean, there's a, a much more imposter trials, there's non target trials than the target trials. So then, of course, we cannot use classification error. <coughs> okay, so we've got to a little bit of literature review here, and the non cooperative subjects were studied. And uh, this was done in the uh, SRI in, in the US, and uh, I reported it to that section speaker, let's say. And so in this case, they, they want to study, I mean, so the, if you think about the non-cooperative case, you have two kinds of uh, errors that you can induce to a system. You can, you can, do, you can try to imitate. If you are, in, if you are non, part of the non-target trial, you, try to, you can try to imitate a target. So that causes uh, type 1 errors, and type 2 errors then the, you are trying to not be recognized. So you are the target trial, and you are not trying to not be recognized. <coughs> so there were 32 speakers recorded in four different sessions, and there were more than two uh, uh, disguised cases. So they. In this case study, they try they study only the voice disguise, which means that you are trying not to be re re not to be re uh, recognized. <coughs> there were 25 listeners, and the they were all the listening exercises were done in a controlled situation. And this is different to our case, where everybody has had chance to listen on their own. There are many listeners actually here in the room. <laughs> you can say <laughs> how they have actually done listening, but in this trial and many other previous studies, they, they have set up a separate listening room and listen and, and time, and you have you are listening at that set that time, and you you uh, play back the sound maybe only only once, and uh, so it's completely definitely different in this case. Uh, the, so the 25 listeners, and they have to say for each trial whether it's true or false, I'm not sure. So they have a third, third case also. <coughs> and so the uh, sample one, utterance one, utterance two are played back continuously. Um, training segment. So okay, so they had a separate training segment and separate test segments. Uh, training segment 2.5 minutes and the test segment <coughs> was very short, 5 to 20 seconds. In this case, the idea here is that if you force people to listen uh, long, long segments, 
they would get very bored. <laughs> okay. the, uh, I think uh, our idea was instead that, okay, so you have the tools at hand, you have Audacity or whatever kind of tool you want to use, and you can you can scroll and, and play back the, uh, the pieces of the speed signal that you are most, in, most interested in. So you don't need to listen from start to finish. And this is what they have done here. Uh, <coughs> so, so uh, okay. Actually, yeah, I, I brought you the <laughs> wrong way. So, so human listeners did better than GM UTM systems that they had as a as an automatic system. Also, uh, the performance is pretty okay in a non-degraded case, but in the, the performance was degraded, and the human, human performance was, was better. Okay. So, in the language ID, uh, in 2008, speaker of the status tried also, and this is also interesting, is trying to figure out whether. Uh, human is better at language ID or or the um, or machine, and uh, they uh, used a least LRI 05 corpus, and only 10 second subset. The the turn out to be 2,421 trials, and compared to the previous one, there were much less trials. 38 listeners were recruited, and each had to listen average 63 samples. And now you have, uh, this is a little bit different to speaker recognition case because you now you can only listen to those test samples. You have been given a claim that this is uh, Indian, this is English, or so on, um, but you listen only the test case. And they have, so if you are, you are sure that this is, this is the language you are looking at, if the claim is correct, you don't need to do anything else, just listen to 10 seconds. But if you are not sure, you, they had a possibility of, of playing some some random sample from the training segment of the claim claimed language. <coughs> and this is also organized in some specific group. So um, human pool actually the detection cost 23% and state of the art system 7.15 and the uh, this uh, this was PUT. So there was a very there's a very big difference. The humans were definitely much worse. But the okay, well how it was organized was that the no human completed all the two thousand trials, but there were only those sixty three trials. So they have to pull everything together, and human performance varied, of course. So there are different humans have very good at detecting different languages. <coughs> And the uh, the and this probably has something to do with how much exposure you have to one, one of those those languages. And this is actually if you think about the speaker verification problem <coughs> doing a human speaker verification. You are very good at usually recognizing the person you know. So what you have some exposure to that language. And this is exactly also in the language that if you have exposure to, to some some language. And you are you are better at, at recognizing. And this is uh, the humans were the, with the breakdown of different languages, and humans were definitely better recognizing English, but not all the other languages. The UK system was was better at recognizing. Okay. So the exposure has an import importance, and when we are trying to kind of limit that exposure, so of course we are. Uh, our, our samples are only for people that we don't know. <coughs> so, and uh, the, the forensic speaker verification case, the, this is done in, in, um, in Switzerland, and there is a French speaking corpus. Training segments were, were, were the short, 90 seconds, and then test segments of 10 to 20.